All right, I want to get this out of the way right now. Nobody is adding anything new to this conversation, myself included. This video only exists because I got sucked up by nostalgia, became curious enough to buy the movie and rewatch. If you're watching this, you are witnessing some accomplishment born of a man who is over three and a half decades old and decided to spend his time outside of his nine to five to pour blood, sweat, and tears into an overindulgent retrospective review of this movie. This review has been one of my creative albatrosses this year. Most of that comes down to depression and anxiety and procrastination and self-hate, lather, rinse, repeat. The rest comes from not having written something like this before. And the only way I've been able to finish it is by structuring it the same way I used to do my blog essays. Yeah, that's right. I said blog. Member blogs? You know, back when Alexander Graham Bell was president, we all drove steam engines to the schoolhouse. And in those days, Nichols had pictures of bumblebees on them. Give me five bees for a quarter, you'd say. Because I am old. How old? Because of the old that I am, having witnessed the unfortunate, unceasing consistency of time marching onward, it has been since the era of MySpace that I have written something like a blog, post, essay, noun, thing, which is to say, ages. Apart from depression and anxiety, this is what made this script even more difficult to complete. In short, this is Fisher Price's My First YouTube Video Essay. I tried learning from a lot of my favorite creators. The main thing that I've learned is not to swear in the first minute. Cursing in the beginning of your video will ruin your monetization, apparently, even if the video is mature rated, which I think is a load of malarkey. All of those writing hurdles are aside from the unavoidable fact that writing anything during a writer's strike, even if the writer's strike recently ended, feels gross, comes off gross. Making any sort of content feels like scab writing and producing, but when it came to finishing this review, I had to. I felt this one too much. Right here. Not here or here so much, but right here. At the risk of sounding overdramatic, nostalgia is a demon. It makes enemies of us all. It brings a consistent joy, yet still feels to slip through our fingers. This is why I feel we should be more honest with our nostalgia and seek why the things we treasure are so dear to us. See, I grew up as one of them fabled latchkey kids that the media would go on about in the 90s. Don't get me wrong, mom did raise me. But the rest of the raising was by television, movies, music, video games, any sort of comedy. My dad was also there. Please clap. Again, any of the non-children's programming that I watched was vetted. I wasn't just let loose to watch whatever, but anything tame mom would allow. This made me one of the few kids growing up who was allowed to watch The Simpsons. It puts me in this weird existence where I can revisit shows as an adult that I used to love when I was five and have a far better chance of enjoying them now as an adult than if I were to revisit something like Inspector Gadget. Not everything but many of the things that I watched as a kid have held up for me. Perfect example, my favorite sitcom when I was five years old was Perfect Stranger. Somehow that show still makes me laugh as an adult. It kind of holds up. I also love Sesame Street at five, but I'm not cracking open a Dos Equis, throwing on the opposite song and letting one blaze. That's opposite. I mean, the song is a bop. It's just a different experience than when I was a kid. I used to bounce around the living room when that song came on. Now when I hear it, I just nod my head and go, Instead, did used to be my jam. I know what opposites are now, I don't need the review. Compare that to Tommy Boy or Wayne's World. Two films I saw super young that hit different as an adult. Some of this is because the jokes I was once too young for are no longer going over my head. Hey, that's a pretty girl down there. Good for her. Jeez, I wonder if she goes out with one of the Yankees. Really didn't know that these were self-love jokes? Is that what we'll call it? Is that gonna get me take... Like, what do you cook? YouTube, you need to put out a pamphlet on what the words you want us to say and not say are. We, we're trying to pay rent. The other part is my memory. My emotional memory is very strong. Even if I can't remember how I would have worded it as a kid, I can vividly remember how I was feeling during various times in my life. It's very loud whenever I go to re-watch something. But aside from a few, I really haven't revisited many of the kid films I grew up on. I can quote to you most of The Little Rascals and Emperor's New Groove, but even those I haven't seen in years. I don't have kids either, so there's no one around to inflict my childhood movie choices on. So I just go back to the films that I watched when I was too young to watch them on my own, like Liar Liar. 
Stop breaking the law, asshole! Which I cannot help myself. I still absolutely love Liar Liar. Maybe that's another essay. What the hell are you doing? I'm kicking my ass, divine! So after burying myself in YouTube essays the past five years to avoid depression and the world, as well as learning the legacy of this infamous film we're talking about today, I was encouraged to give it a rewatch. I was not dead set on writing an essay. The internet is not starving for another random dude's take on Shaq's magnum opus, but I had optimism. I wasn't expecting it to be as bad as everyone says, so I took notes. <clears throat> Spoilers. It is bad. It's as bad as everyone says it is, and it breaks my nine-year-old heart. But because I want to make sure I don't get any takedowns for posting this review and including the footage of the movie, let me prepare you now. I've committed an unspeakable sin and just filmed the movie with my phone. I, I, I know. I know. It's, don't, don't just don't throw garbage. I am very sorry, I feel gross, I feel fraudulent, and I, just like you, hate all of those YouTube videos, but we all know Bob Iger is more than likely in trigger figure mode because of, you know, recent incidents. I am sure of the possibility that this video can be flagged, and as much as it bothers me to not use actual clear footage, I would be even more angry if I spent 40 bucks on a DVD ripper, 20 bucks to have the DVD shipped, and the mouse still strikes it down. Keep in mind, I did use a tripod and mess with the colors of the television to make it seem normal. Again, forgive me for this, but I'm trying to keep this online, so... You know, we do what we can. And even though I worked hard to capture the audio cleanly, I did have some issues with a couple of the clips. I am Kazam! So to make up for that, I had to re-record the dialogue on my own. I am Kazam! Just kidding, we got clean audio, don't worry. I am Kazam! What, if you're not getting rickrolled, are you even online? And last piece of unorganized business and all the other drafts that I wrote, I couldn't figure out where to place this particular observation. So let's get this out of the way now. So, until I make those last two wishes, I own you, don't I? Technically. No. 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 I know it was the 90s. I know it's just a kid's movie. I know it doesn't mean that. And it's very possible that I'm being an overly aware, hypersensitive white person. But no, no, no. Don't, don't do that. We should never be making jokes about a white person owning a black person for obvious reasons. And we certainly shouldn't be smiling over it. Actually, enough time has passed. Let me rephrase. We sure as shit aren't smiling over it. But I digress, my name is Theo, and this is how I reconciled with the bedraggled 90s classic known as Kazam. Not Shazam, by the way, let's also put this to rest. Sinbad was never in a movie called Shazam where he played a genie called Shazam that's your mind messing with your head, as well as college humor's fault. I'm sure they confused the further hell out of people with that one, but it is an anomaly, a fabrication, which is to say, it's something made up by Nelson Mandela for some reason. The 90s classic that you're thinking of that stars Simbet is Jingle All the Way. Or First Kid. But I don't remember First Kid that much. Jingle All the Way was my fucking shit, though. We were buried to our necks in sand like a sea by the sultan with a sword and a lock and a key. I look to a bird and he says to me, and when the magic is over, we ain't men, we see. For me, Kazam was lightning in a bottle. At the same time that I was trying out whatever hip-hop albums I could get my hands on and playing non-stop NBA Jam, this movie comes out. I begged my mom to take it, and I ate it up. It was my Citizen Kane, my avatar, if you will. After catching wind of everyone else's memory of it is when I realized that that film meant a lot to nine-year-old me. For the uninitiated, Kazam is a film starring basketball legend Shaquille O'Neal at the high point of his career. The film itself was pitched and written around Shaq, so as far as the rest of the cast, it's pretty much this kid, his mom, his absentee dad, his overly supportive stepdad-to-be, the antagonist, the antagonist's assistant, an assortment of bullies, this frosted flakes of a best friend that bounces at the first sign of trouble, thank you for having my back, dude, and a brat. 
And this is not at all to belittle the rest of the cast. It's very much a movie that bleeds Shaq vehicle. The actor who plays Max, Francis Capra, does very well, especially for his age. He feels like a real kid from the city. And as far as the other roles, it's fairly light on overly bad acting. It's not great, but I've seen far worse, you know? The story came from Paul Michael Glazer, who had the chance of meeting Shaq and pitched him the story. With a limited amount of time to film and a feature-length production before Shaq would have his NBA commitments to attend to, the script was written in about six and a half weeks, even though the time given to have a screenplay written and greenlit was two and a half months. Please keep these two fun facts in the backseat of your mind. I also have nowhere clean and tidy to put this observation, but Paul Michael Glazer, the director, He's fucking Starsky in the original Starsky and Hutch. There's nothing wrong with that, but I just don't know what to do with that info apart from putting it here. It's in the top 10 of the most useless facts that live rent-free in my mind. I will die with that fun fact trapped in my head. It may be one of the last things that I think as I pass. I wish I would have done this more. I wish I would have forgiven that person. And Starsky from the original Starsky and Hutch directed Kazam. The biggest battery powering this obsession, which led to this script, which led to this video, is how history has treated Kazam. When Michael Jordan told me that quote, before you succeed, you must first learn He didn't tell you he wanted to be in Kazam too? (laughs) (laughs) Time has taken a bag of rocks to this movie, and it was making me sad. Everyone suffering from the Mandela effect and thinking it was Shazam was making it even worse. A midnight screening of Shazam, everyone's favorite 90s genie movie starring Sinbad. The shack of comedy. The catalyst is a clip from one of my favorite shows of all time. I'd like to remake the movie Kazam with Shaquille O'Neal where he plays a genie and I'd like to get it right. Wait, wait. Is that what every is that what most people think? No, 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 it can't. N- nostalgia hasn't gotten me. I don't get got by nostalgia. I'm reasonable. I mean, I like my shit, and my shit is my shit, but I'm honest with my shit. Kazam was not that bad, all right? All, all of you are wrong is what, is what the issue is. And shut up, I'm not crying, you're crying. You just, you just didn't get it. Watch, let me, just, let me just pull this up. The reviews can't be that bad. Oh. Oh no. It was then I realized I had fallen victim to nostalgia. But let's stop playing intro games and actually get into this. Our hero is Max, your average city kid. He's misunderstood, he's aimless, his mom doesn't get it, his dad's not around, but this dude is. His teachers are always on his case, bullies. While getting chased by the aforementioned bullies, he's saved by Kazam, a man Max finds in an abandoned building. Kazam says he's a genie. Max totally believes him. Well, I'm really happy for you. Kazam won't leave Max alone, but he doesn't want to give chase. Max just needs to make three wishes, and Kazam is... Back in my box and out of his place! After Kazam proves his genie worth with a grandiose wish gesture, I, I guess you'd call it. And I say I guess because even though this was the coolest part of the movie for me as a concept, when I was a kid, the junk food wish... It's, it's the most unappealing, non-camera-ready junk food I've ever seen in cinema. Did they not have any budget for props? They really just made a burger, gave one of the crew a ladder, and told them to drop it from the top. Also, pancakes? Pancakes aren't junk food, they're breakfast, thank you very much. But I digress. After this first wish, Max becomes a believer and decides to use his genie as a backup plan for anything that goes wrong with his ultimate goal, bring his dad and his mom back together so they can be a family again. This leads to Max stealing merchandise from his father's job for attention, which in turn causes major problems for his dad. During all of this, Kazam is being led by the nose with his music dreams and almost ends up trapped by the antagonist who's figured out Kazam's true origin somehow. There is a ancient uh, phrase, uh, Sultan's gold. <laughs> you speak. Oh, uh, you know. <laughs> you are the Sultan's gold. <laughs> and we'll break the story apart beat by beat as we go, but let's start with some of the small stuff before we get into any of the major plot hole crimes. Hey, Buzz! You're flying! This isn't flying, this is falling with style. Well, 
maybe logic jumping isn't accurate enough. The theme that runs across all of this film's mistakes is basically the unexplained and the poorly explained. Let me explain. Too many things within the plot, the character arcs, and even the scenes are not properly set up if they're ever set up. From little things to major plot points, the story moves forward if the audience is constantly explaining away the plot holes and absolving them. And this is a major problem I see throughout films, television, books, games, wherever there's a story. Too many of us in the audience are willing to start off a debate about whether something is good with a good old fashioned, well, <laughs> actually the character is X because of Y so they feel Z. And none of this is explained within the story. We absolve creators too often. There's far too many diehard Riverdale fans or Euphoria fans that are sitting on defense attorney levels of debates on why the stories make sense. It's not just these shows and it's certainly not a recent phenomenon. With social media, it's just gotten worse. Random example, let's say we're writing a horror movie. It's towards the end of the film, killer's in the house, the main character, the final girl if you will, is hiding in the closet. Let's say we want to have the character jump out of the closet and attack the killer with a knife. You cannot have them brandishing knife out of the closet just out of nowhere even with something that simple where did they get the knife why was it in the closet and i'm not that persnickety oh uh the character keeps the knife in the closet okay why well it's a memento of her mother she was a chef before she died she keeps her favorite butcher knife in a safe place and only orders take out that works so all we need to do is make sure that earlier in the film we show the character putting the box with the knife in it in the closet so when we're at the end of the film and the character is in the closet the only thing the character needs to do is give a side eye to the box if the filmmakers have done their job correctly the audience will know exactly what's about to happen next it takes time to make setup like that rewarding but on paper that is how we easy it is. However, if you require some stands of your story to all caps explain these plot points and none of this information is in the story, within the frame if you will, then you fucked up. It's not in the frame, it's not in the game. It also doesn't have to be just an exposition dump where two characters are just explaining what's supposed to be happening within a conversation. With my horror film example, all that needs done is proper setup earlier in the story that tells the audience of the character's mom, the mom's job and passion, and show how important the relationship with the mom is to the main character. It's not Shakespeare, but that is good enough, especially if all of this is within the story or within the frame. Any story can work and you can have as many weird plot elements, you just have to put in the work to make them make sense and properly convey it to the audience. This obviously isn't the case with abstract cinema. Something that is unexplainable on purpose follows different rules. The Shaq Genie movie is not art house though. This is narrative based, and narrative based media needs to tell the story within itself. Meaning, I shouldn't have to have my best friend who loves the show, or that co-worker who loves the show, or however many people on the internet explaining to me what I'm missing from the show itself. Too many shows and movies are propped up by their fans, explaining away major plot elements, and it makes me sad. It's an issue. It needs to be stopped. This has been my TED Talk. Kazam is absolutely lousy with this problem, and I hate it so very much. Let me make this perfectly clear. Next time we do that, I'm donating your brain to science, okay? <laughs> for anyone looking to skip film school, first few scenes are for establishing your main character or characters. And the very first thing you see them in, how they're dressed, what they say, how they say it, how they carry themselves, where they are, what they're doing, is all for setting up what their story is going to be. If you have a character that's forgetful, and it's going to be important later in the story, that character needs to forget two things in the first 10 minutes. Three if you're industrious. Films have to be set up like this because there's a limited amount of time to set up your characters and tell your story. You cannot have everything set in dialogue. Do not listen to Mr. Chronically Single, Always Dating Some New Hot Chick Guy. Being married is great. That's the point of view I represent. Deb and I have been married for eight years, and it's better now than when we first met. Swish! So seeing Max aimlessly wander the hallways of his school, dragging a random key across a row of lockers, and being a general nuisance before returning to class to get a scolding from a teacher as a consequence, all of that is to tell us about Max and everything we need to know about him. He's the anti-hero all us 90s kids were looking for. And even though I just finished that diatribe about plot holes, you can just have a scene or two that's just a scene. If it's servicing the character or adds to the story slash tone, it's permissible. However, if you have a scene like this, it shouldn't be just 
just as much of a narrative mess as the main story, and it's just a lot to be seeing weird, inexplicable choices being made within the first minutes. It comes off being the canary in the coal mine for the film as a whole, more than it accomplishes being a fun foundational scene. The key to the supply closet, Maxwell. The key? To the supply closet? Oh, I left in the door, Mrs. Duke. And you also left us without enough time to hear your little presentation. But I want to hear it anyway, right here after school. Wait, why did he have the supply closet key? Did he take it from you? If so, you're awfully calm for a teacher in a city school who just had a school key taken from you. If he didn't take it, why did he sign it out? You're allowing keys to known class skippers? That seems like an odd move. They're cat hairs. If you can see it on, on, on the camera, there's cat hairs. It's cat hairs. Or gray hairs. Who knows? Why was he given the responsibility when it's very obvious we're supposed to think he's the cool aimless kid who skips class and scoffs at extracurricular responsibilities such as supply closet key keeper? And for real, seriously, what the hell was in that supply closet and why doesn't Max have it with him when he comes back to class and why are you not chewing him out over that? No bother, I guess, we soldier on through the movie. After school, Max comes home and is asked where the vacuum motor is by his mom. This scene confused the hell out of me when I was a kid. It's supposed to introduce us to Max being a gearhead and the type of kid that would fuck up his mom's appliances for more engines, motors, parts to work with. The problem is the subtext. When Max and his mom are talking about the missing vacuum parts, it's all shorthand, and the scene doesn't have anything preceding it that shows us Max is into taking things apart and rebuilding them. You don't even see his room where it's half of a mechanic shop and until after this scene, nor do you see the abandoned building where he's constructed a whole hangout zone complete with lighting design. The answer was not simply to put these scenes before the missing vacuum motor scene, but we did need a better foundation built than what we had because without it, this just feels like an insider conversation that the audience isn't in on. But, you know, the only good news is you weren't here when we were robbed. What kind of maniac was still the motor to our Hoover? <laughs> you were supposed to come home today and help me clean up, remember? All of this is minute, but then we start getting into slightly more egregious territory, and I'm not talking just about the musical number. My name is Kazam, I got the whole plan. So listen to the man, cause I'm the Sultan of Sand. <laughs> is that it? Is that the whole deal? You wanna be a hit, you better get real. And I thought I would have a litany of roast jokes about the musical number, but I, I don't. I'm tired and it's just bad. It's corn. Pure cheese. And I didn't enjoy it, which is saying something because I was one of the few kids who actually enjoyed Shaq's raps. What? I was seven and I had just found hip hop. I didn't know any better. The whole thing is very much shoved in to appease Shaq's music team at the time. And I know I'm going to get roasted for admitting I like the Shaq Fu album, but I mean, shit. Most of the Shaq Fu album was better than any of the rhymes here. Actually, and this is not just because I know Shaq could flick me into the Pacific Ocean from Michigan. When it comes to Shaq's rapping in Kazam, the only part I like was the intro. Watch it, boy! You don't want to diss me! Or I'll dish out my misery. Now, who's that sorry wannabe that disturbed my seeds? Now, 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 you're not hearing me claim bars. It just works is what I'm saying. Hey, wait. Thanks, guys. Point is, we ain't men, we genie comes off whack and forced. It also doesn't make sense. Max isn't a genie. He's fucking 12. What are we, Max? We genie! Yo! You don't know. The musical number becomes extra frustrating because, apart from that, the most of an origin story we get for Kazam is the opening scene, a random abandoned building that is being demolished. Why? It's not explained. But that's a good example of something that doesn't really need it. Buildings get demolished all the time. We move on. I came in like a rainbow. 
The only explanation to the building is the sign that says lamps, and I'll admit ignorance. I take it genie lamps were multi-purpose and had more than one use? Because childhood Theo thought this meant there were businesses selling or renting genies, which is a terrible dream to have crushed. When we first meet Kazam, he's in a lamp. We know it's Kazam because we hear Shaq's voice yelling no as the building crumbles and his lamp falls. We don't see the lamp land. We have no other scenes involving Kazam between this and when Max first meets him. I am Kazam! And now his genie lamp is no longer a genie lamp, it's a genie boombox. Full disclosure, that is why we're all here. Not at all complaining about the aesthetics. The selling point of the film was Shaq as a rapping genie and his lamp is a boombox. That's why you have my money, or more appropriately, my mom's money. I wanted to see Shaq's bit bars coming out of a boombox that never needs batteries. But fucking how? He was in some dusty ass lamp before and an even dustier assier building. Where did the boombox come from? More film school hacks for your mind? Movies work on shorthand. Instead of reinventing the wheel at each possible turn, it's easier to lean into known tropes within films or story and genre as a whole. Many films are set or set against the tropes of the genre that they're playing in, which is just another way to tell the story. Meaning, if there's something that the audience is used to, but the filmmakers want to do something different, it needs to be set up within the script. The landscape of society that Kazam came out in is what's better known as post-Robin Williams as Genie AD. Basic Hollywood Genie lore states they cannot leave the lamp. They are bound to it and bound to the person that wakes them from their slumber until the wishing of three wishes. I didn't make the rules. And as far as the games that we're playing today, you're arguing with nine-year-old me and this lamp jumping nonsense is not the rules of Genie engagement. He was in some ancient carafe before and Genie's allegedly can't do shit until somebody wakes them. No Genie has ever talked about switching lamps, but in a world where he needs to wait for some kid to finish wishing Shaq can just move house when he wants to, this is something that the filmmakers need to explain to us. Quick Quickest and most popular example, if good old Eddie Cullen doesn't fall into ash when the sun hits his eye like a big pizza pie, then what the fuck does happen? Regardless of the lack of adherence to preconceived notions of genie protocol, it still needs exposition. The boombox shows to be a power source to Kazan. He even loses it at one point in the story and gets all concerned. My box! Where's my box? At don't worry about the little things that listen. So even though it were not his first home, it's important. This is why this needs to be explained, because why does it matter when it's lost? When we first knew him, he was in this thing. Film school cheap trick number three, set up your story early. You don't want to pull out the important element at the 11th hour and be like, by the way, uh, if someone steals Shaq's boombox, he's bound to it like some weird cosmic leash. You don't have to beat the audience over the head with story points, but you do need to set them up for success. So guiding their focus to what's going to be important early in the film is never a bad thing. Another quick example, the world's end. When we get to the main part of the town, we see this statue. There's even some dialogue about it. What is that? Modern art. It's a memorial, isn't it? Yeah, it's a modern art. <laughs> and the reason we have this small scene is because later in the film, oh no, look out, holy shit, it's coming right for us. <laughs> It's coming right for us. So we, the audience, aren't made aware that it's imperative that Kazam keeps his boombox lamp nearby until close to the third act of the film. I mean, we can assume that's usually the case with genies. But you've already proven yourself a bull in the china shop when it comes to certain aspects of the Hollywood genie handbook. So I mean, what's good? Can an audience get an explanation up in here? These are all things that may have been absolved in a better movie. You might have gotten away with this and the audience wouldn't have thought about it much. Notice I said might have and, and may have. Truly depends on the movie. But then we have even bigger problems like the immortality of our main character, what I call Max's diamond bones, causing him to fall through multiple floors in an abandoned building and later again in an elevator shaft with nothing to show for it but some Bruce Willis dirt on his face. Seriously, this kid is Wolverine and Deadpool all at once, I swear to God. I didn't want him dead. I didn't want him recovering in the hospital, even. What I'm saying is you didn't have to throw him down a damn elevator shaft. You could have avoided the whole thing by finding a better dramatic tension. And now we're getting into bigger problems. Tony Stark realizes that there is a... I know who that is. I know who that is. 
This is the first person I've known. Tony Stark realizes I, I do not recognize uh, the chair. Tony Stark realizes. Because Max's diamond bones breaking every multi-story fall he suffers isn't the only time Max, as a character, has diplomatic immunity from the writers. This is an unfortunate symptom in many films and TV shows, where a character is never wrong, never in danger, always seemingly guided by the filmmakers. I am Kazam. Max is a character that's led by the script. Nothing can happen to Max because the script will not allow it. So him falling without a scrape makes sense. Why have something happen to Max? We can't do that. It's a kids movie and if we try for dramatic tension that scares kids, I mean, I mean, why, why would we scare children? That's weird. It's extra frustrating because I remember many intense kids films where the characters were in danger and it was fine. It's one of the most depressing kid films I watched growing up, but The Fox and the Hound is my favorite example. And I'll admit bias, it's my favorite example because it is my favorite Disney film of all time. Yeah, I said it. That's right. Fox and the Hound is the best Disney film of all time. It's a beautiful film about friendship and everyone should watch it. Twice. I would make it my sole presidential platform of Fox and the Hound in every home. Best Disney film that's not Pixar related. Fight me. Keeping with examples from the House of Mouse, remember Lion King? Mufasa dying was also not fun and we barely trusted Scar as it was. Let us also never forget the therapy sessions spent on Bambi's mother dying. And yes, they were toys. But Buzz and Woody almost never saw Andy again. Hey, don't look at me like that. You ever lose your favorite toy when you're a kid? This shit is your world when you're a child. I'm not crying, you're crying. And it's not always refusing to let a character die or get injured. Most of the time it's just refusing to let the main character be wrong. Which again is frustrating because there's been many kids films that have allowed their characters to be imperfect. And it's provided a better story. Even though it was released after Kazam, I'll use Emperor's New Groove as an example. In Emperor's New Groove, our main hero is Cusco. He's not perfect, he has many flaws, he's actually an insufferable asshole. As an adult, there's very little difference I see between Cusco's actions and the actions of real life billionaires. Isn't it great? It's my birthday gift to me. <laughs> I'm so happy. Tread out the water park for a once decent social media empire and is not much different. <laughs> the benefit of having imperfect characters not only includes a better, more engaging story, but for kids you have the chance for a much more impactful theme and lesson. If Cusco never suffered an actual consequence for his behavior, his character arc would be lackluster and his growth would be undeserved. And all that would have been accomplished is 90 minutes of distracted children, more money into the moss's pocket, and nothing learned. Compare that to Max, who seems to stumble into everything inexplicably. When he begins to search for his dad, we don't even know what he's looking for when he discovers his dad's full name. Max doesn't have much setup to set him on the path for beginning the search for old Pop. But none of that matters because he quickly notices his mom just fucking left the divorce papers on the table? So I know his mom's going through a lot. At least I'm assuming she's going through a lot, which is what Starsky the director certainly wants us to assume by any scene that she's in. It makes sense that there's little focus on the parents in a kid's film, but kids are paying attention to their parents. So it wouldn't be out of place to throw her a B story, something. Regardless of knowing the why, we do see that Max's mom has a shit ton to deal with because she's regularly exasperated. Apparently even to the point where she's not thinking ahead and saying, maybe I should keep the divorce filings in my bedroom and not on the damn kitchen table disguised as a pile of bills. But let's give the mom less shit, because how does Max even stumble upon on this. The scene involves him just walking up to the table, he moves a couple papers around, and just like that he knows his dad's name. You know, I bet they really miss you at the nice building with the padded walls. After that, it almost becomes like a dare. How many plot holes can we steamroll over? When Max first enters the building, he shoot away, one of the few obstacles that ever stands in Max's way throughout this whole film. This would have been a great moment to have Kazam help sneak him in. Miss Mateo? Who? Your mother. Nah, Max just goes around the back way and gets in. No hassle, he's got pull. I go wherever I want, I got pull. Oh, he's got pull now. And if that's not maddening enough, he's just walking around the warehouse. People everywhere, he's barely stopped. Just a fucking kid walking around in what we will learn to be a crime warehouse. Oh, what crimes, you ask? I just watched the film, and hell if I know. I think it's music piracy or something. Because it's the only cool crime that we can put in a kid's movie that won't have parents writing us letters. Oh, sorry, for any kids watching this, first, why? This movie's older than you, and I'm older than it. 
But to explain before the advent of Facebook, when parents would become outraged, they had to pull out a feather quill and some parchment to be like, to whom it may concern at PBS. As a Christian, Barney the dinosaur offends me because God created Earth, not Darwin. Stop indoctrinating my children. And oh, you thought Starsky was done? After walking around a restricted access area unencumbered, Max bursts into his dad's office and his dad is the first to say, Who are you? I'm Max. Finally, an obstacle, which also provides us a nice somber moment in the following scene between Max and Kazam. So, tough guy, who was that loser? That was my father. <laughs> Was that guy really your father? Acting like he didn't even know you. Look, he hasn't seen me in a long time. I was two, okay? Where did he go? Away. That's a long time away. I mean, it's not two or three thousand years, but that's a long time. It's a nice moment, I won't lie. We're getting closer to why this film resonates. Max returns again. His dad's about to bounce him before Max reveals his full name. What's his dad's reaction? Connor. Actual Connor. My son. Okay. I don't know your life, but how many criminals do you know? that'll A, allow a kid to walk around their hideout, and B, allow that same kid to walk around again and believe the kid when he says, I'm your son, which Max didn't even say. All he did was drop his surname and it works for this dude, I don't know. Within minutes, he's ordering pizza, he's showing off music, he's introducing Max to everyone as his son just off the name. Seriously, how many Connors are there in New York? What, you think I don't know my own boy when I... How are you a successful criminal in this haphazardly trusting? Do you even do crimes successfully? I'm starting to think you're not very good at crimes. Hey there, five G. That crimes. And I'm not judging. I can imagine doing crimes is very stressful. Maybe you're frazzled, not always thinking of everything. But if I'm gonna start crimes, especially those that would necessitate an entire warehouse. I don't even own a gun, let alone many guns that would necessitate an entire rack. I would hope I would have enough about myself to hold a small orientation, just going over. Alright, make sure that you always reset your passwords, lock the doors, don't let any children fucking meander around the warehouse like it's a freeform field trip, and be wary of any emotional manipulation tactics from any strangers that you may meet, regardless of age, because, you know, we want to be careful because we're doing crimes. What am I gonna do with a gun rack? That should have put all eyes on Max, and in doing so could have gave the story much more to work with. Max's dad and surrounding characters never questioning Max's claim is a missed opportunity at best. But who am I to nitpick? This is a reunion. Am I so callous to stick on these glaring white hot plot holes and ignore the fact that a boy is reunited with his father? We don't spend much time looking for Max's dad, but after the few minutes tracking him down in the first random building Max walks into, we only get maybe two minutes of acceptance of absentee fatherhood before we're seeing Max stroll on home, have the obligatory argument with his mom. You will never be my father. You watch your mouth. Watch yours. You lied to me. You told my father wasn't here, but he is. I've seen him. And now he is more team dad than he was previously. And I do see things like a whole bunch of silly people counting on a whole bunch of silly wishes. Let me be the first to tell you, the future don't always follow the plan. The plan sucks big time. See, I'm making my future year, Kaz. And the next step is two all access passes to tonight's concert. Wait, what big show? Where'd he get those tickets? What the hell is he talking about? And why couldn't you show us this? As far as the audience is concerned, Max met his dad three minutes ago and now he's got pull. I got pull. With the power to just brandish tickets as the plot necessitates. Because instead of building something rewarding, the writers just need things to happen. And the plot needs to keep moving, so fuck it, Max has tickets now. They could have kept it at this weird breakneck pace the film goes at, and it only would have added a few more minutes. This could have done wonders. Some of the film works, and its scrappy charm is prevalent throughout. Don't say I didn't warn you, boys. I think I'm gonna wait outside, man. 
No way, man. This is cool. Rocky, Bullwinkle, shall we? Come on, Rocky. But it wants to feel like a movie more than it wants to be one. It's the cinematic equivalent of three kids in a trench coat going to see an R-rated film. You hear that, Bojack? Vincent is an adult, and I'll bet he knows how to treat a lady. He very clearly isn't and doesn't. Would you like alcohol? If no one asks questions, the system works. Tell me all about you. Mm, I like business. Uh, transactions? <laughs> now, the plot holes, they're egregious. The unexplained, kind of funny. All of those things could be saved with a rewrite. But the film is pretty damn racist. I'm saying you're a football player. It's in your blood. That's racist. Your soul. That's racist. Your eyes. That's gay. That's homophobic. That's black. That's racist. Damn. As aforementioned, I am an overly sensitive, recently aware white. So we'll edge into this slowly. First, when it comes to antagonists, depending on the story, they should be menacing. Not every story deserves a big bag complete with an alleged holocaust allegory. See Toy Story 3, for example. Yeah, I knew Lotso. He was a good toy. A friend. Me and him, we had the same kid. But you don't want a boring antagonist. Even if everything else is good, it sticks out. See the first Guardians of the Galaxy for an example. So there's nothing inherently wrong with making the antagonist unlikable. The problem comes from the decision to make the antagonist from another culture. A culture that is known to be misunderstood and judged by too many Americans. Malik as the bad guy is a series of bad filmmaking decisions because instead of building an antagonist with motivations and explaining those motivations through the story, everything about Malik as a character is assumed through the composition of shots he's in. And if you ask me, Starsky is snitching on himself when it comes to his intentions with this character when it comes to the composition of each frame. Because even the way his food is framed is meant to be unsettling. Shots like this were when I knew what I was dealing with. There's nothing wrong with this food, there's nothing wrong with this culture. But when you got a character that's meant to be seen as the bad guy, every shot he's in is framed in an odd way, most of his story is unknown, and you stick the camera onto a table as he eats? Am I not meant to see some racial bias sneaking through? Any American disagreeing with me needs to see this from the other side. In a culture where we are normally seen as the bad guys, a movie even a kid's movie where some American is evil laughtering as the camera does an extreme close-up of a crumpled up McDonald's bag. Exactly. By the camera's own admission, we're meant to think that this is gross, weird, unnatural. At best, it's reckless. Please, my favorite. Nubian gold eyes? The food of kings. I haven't had these in 3,000 days. You have old-fashioned taste. So we just gonna ignore that hate crime, huh? The potential racist framing of Malik isn't the only issue. Similar to Max's diamond bones, we also have Malik's automatic clairvoyance. The filmmakers know that there's certain things that need to be seen at this point in the film, but oh shit, that's right, we need to set up the bad guy. And fuck, we're already halfway through, screw it. We'll just write him as mysterious, and that'll be our stock reason for why he'll know Kazam's a genie. Bad guys like money, right? Yeah, that's his motivation. So of course it's the only reason he gives a damn and what Kazam's origin. Malik is barely around Kazam and only introduced halfway through, so there's not enough time to set this up anyway. It doesn't even have to be that deep. Malik's parents had a similar run to Max's. They hadn't separated, but it was rocky. Malik had a genie as a kid. Malik's journey as a kid becomes similar to Max's, and you've set yourself up on honing in on the themes that are already in the script. Maybe something happened to Malik's genie and he never got his final wish. Maybe you get even darker with this story. Malik losing out on his final wish from the genie is what leads him to his life of crime. That seems a bit excessive for a kid's movie, but then again, we're rewriting a movie from almost three decades ago. I guess that means no idea is a bad idea. And this is another element that wouldn't add too much to the runtime if you're smart with it. Hell, most of that you can show in a three minute flashback scene. Make it one of those story flows that shoves you into the antagonist's plan before we get into the why. 
because every part of this film's story is clunky as all absolute hell. Don't forget this takes place in the city, presumably NYC. Everyone believing a dude in an abandoned building is a genie as fast as they do may be the biggest plot hole of all. I mean, come on, the head of a criminal outfit is believing some dude has something otherworldly about him because of a golden speck nugget. Again, do not remake Kazam. If you remake Kazam, I will turn this car around. But in a hypothetical world where this is allowed to be a PG-13 affair, another quick way to make Malik's whole fucking everything make sense would be making him think this golden whatever is drugs. He follows Kazam thinking he's the ultimate connect for the drugs, allowing him to stumble onto his genie hood instead of the drugs. Again, not Shakespeare, but tell me you wouldn't kind of want to watch that movie. Because something needs done. This dude just knows about Kazam and the best I could have explained it to you as a kid was, well it's because he's the bad guy. Which is the same move that the writers took. Maybe this works better if you imagine me as a car mechanic. The car is the script. I'm leaning over the script, looking underneath the hood like, see there's your problem right there. Your antagonist motivations are all a mess and your resolution shot to hell. Nevertheless, we drag ourselves towards the resolution. Of course, we gotta end this with a big showdown. And of course, there's gotta be a climactic fight scene. But for some reason, the music goes all Hans Zimmerman on us. which is just mad out of place in this movie. In a film full of hip hop, you complete your final battle scene with a bombastic staccato orchestra. I mean, it's whatever. I'm just saying you could have thrown a beat underneath that shit. There's this part. It just kind of happens to add drama, I guess. And if how I'm talking about the ending makes it feel like it's a mess, it's because the ending is a mess. We go from Max in trouble, to Kazam in trouble, to Kazam playing ball with the bad guys, to the scream. Kazam somberly saves Max, makes a final wish, becomes ethereal and subsequently free. Max comes to and immediately goes frantic child on his mom. Oh, I was, I was in the building, uh, Kazam, he, he was there. Okay, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Dude, dude, and I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of your mom here. Who the fuck is Kazam? Your mom knows your tutor. <laughs> so, so sorry. Max insisted. He's told me so much about you. I'm, I'm sorry, have I, have I met you before? No, ma'am, I haven't had the pleasure. I am Jefferson Allensworth Lamb. Jefferson for he who framed our fine constitution. Allensworth for he who found a community of free blacks. And Lamb, because I like to eat lamb chops. <laughs> oh. The most she knows is that he's helping you with school and has the ability to give breakfast the power of flight. It's just another random bad choice for the filmmakers to make, and again, it just adds superficial emotionality and drama. We get a very undeserved ending for the father, that is poorly explained. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden I was free. Your friend was there. He said something about a second chance. Look, when I come back, I'd like to see you. And we get an equally confusing wrap up for Kazam. You blink, I disappear. Get real, you're getting a job. A job? <laughs> and it's done. Finn. So why? What is this for? This is a film that doesn't even seem to have love from its own filmmakers. Why can't I let it go? It's an absolute mess of a film that I can only enjoy if I remember how much I first enjoyed it. Also, if I don't shame myself for not knowing better story structure. And that's also if I want to choose to ignore the racist camera that keeps pointing at Malik. Why even the review? There's plenty of other Kazam reviews that settle at the bottom of the seafloor of the internet, collecting sediment, so I know I'm not the only one who can't let it go. But why? Is it pure nostalgia? And if it is, can we finally ask why we're nostalgic about some things? Because I'm beginning to believe that we see anything we used to watch as nostalgic and do not analyze the reasons why. When it comes to Kazam, I can tell you why it's stuck in my heart, like a squatter, and it's for way more reasons than I first thought. Yeah, it's the divorce kid element. Let's just get into it. We 
We danced around it a little whilst going through the plot, but Max's struggles are the heart that will carry you through this film. And this is a credit to Francis Capra and even Shaq. Again, the acting isn't great, but there are moments when it's good, and the moments of the film where we are dealing with Max's emotions regarding his home life are just as good enough to catch you off guard. Please do not get it twisted. I am not saying these emotional scenes are great and completely redeem the film. They do not. I cannot overstate that. But for the kids who are not processing their parents' divorce at all, this movie was for us. It makes complete sense for a kid to feel that the only way they can get their parents back together is if they had a genie. That's the heart that propels this story. This movie couldn't make a plot make sense if you had a gun to its head, but for everything else held together with paper clips and rubber bands, Max's motivations always felt real. This is why this hurts that the film doesn't set itself up better. There's so much more impact to be had. The filmmakers were close enough with the heart of the story, but they didn't set it up properly. I'm not gonna go into some flowery rhetoric about how a story, whether a film, a book, game, podcast, show, can impact, change you, teach you, comfort you. If you're watching this video, you already know that. The problem is we don't reflect because reflection is considered overthinking. Overthinking is not going with the flow. What? It's just a fucking basketball genie movie. You're supposed to get 90 minutes of entertainment out of it. That's it. But imagine a film that got all of this right. Imagine a story that did more with what's here. I know some of the discussion will lead to discussions on what's good for kids. During the writing of this, I ended up talking to a coworker about Disney films. As a parent, she talked about how some of the themes in The Lion King were too much for children. And it is incredibly intense, brothers murdering each other for kinghood. It's only a few sex scenes and some foul language away from Game of Thrones. And I'm not here to preach to any parents. That is definitely not my role considering that I don't have kids. All I have is my memories of childhood, but using Lion King as an example, leaving home because of bad family dynamics to find yourself amongst new friends has been my adulthood. The only difference is my uncles aren't going to kill my dad, he's not worth it, and I don't want to be king. Fuck that shit, sounds stressful. The concern I hear, and again, take me with a childless grain of salt, but the concern from parents is how kids will process stuff like this. You don't want to open up Pandora's box and find out your child is not even close to having the emotionality to handle complex adult issues. But for the sake of the damn kids, if not just to give them better stories where they can learn lessons to help them later in life, then at least just do it to give them better stories. They got the character of Max and the general heart of the film down, they just didn't do enough to build around that. And why? Because it's just a kid's movie. Kazam was never going to cause me to fully process my parents' divorce. It's only been until this year that I fully started thinking about my parents' divorce and how all of that made me feel back when I was six years old. My mom and nearly all of her family are the stiff upper lip type, so naturally I adopted that. I combine that with a whole lot of, it's not that bad, it's whatever. It happens, people divorce all the time. And it's funny that I came across this realization because I started this experiment just to see if Kazam was truly as bad as history remembers. I figured I might get an essay out of it. I for sure didn't expect this to lead me down the path of facing myself and my family issues. I mean, I figured I was gonna see myself and Max again like I did when I was a kid. That's why the film should have been better. The film industry fucking needs to get its goddamn shit together when it comes to stories and I'm very sorry for wording it like that. But fuck. Seriously. The idea that Hollywood could get away with presenting a film that crosses off story elements on a checklist instead of building the actual story is the entertainment equivalent of artificial flavors. Look at one of the few successful Marvel films to come out this year, Guardians 3, a film about trauma, regret, abuse, loneliness, community, redemption, and compare that to the recent Ant-Man. A camel is a horse designed by committee. That is a major reason why the WGA strike was so important, why striking anywhere in the entertainment industry is important. We need to get back to telling stories that mean a damn. And we can have fun, amazing, dumb bullshit. You think I want to live in a world where there's no action movies? However, we should balance our diet. We should not cast away films that'll move and challenge us. We'll impoverish ourselves if we do. And we should demand better stories. Especially with a film like this because, well fuck, the divorce rate isn't slowing down. And I don't need to be a father to never wish the same divorced childhood that I had on anyone else.
Actually, enough time has passed. Let me rephrase. We sure as shit aren't smiling over it. See, this face is... this. I'm making this face just in case I have to censor all of the fucking audio anyway. God damn you, YouTube.